Just ahead on One Detroit, we'll hear what's planned for this year's Detroit Regional Chamber Mackinac Policy Conference. Plus, three U.S. military veterans talk about the importance of the Memorial Day holiday. Also ahead, a Detroit filmmaker showcases the Nigerian community for a PBS digital series. And we'll share some ideas on holiday weekend activities in Metro Detroit. It's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Just ahead on this week's One Detroit. In recognition of Memorial Day, a group of veterans talk about their time in the military and how they honor their fallen comrades. Plus, a Detroit filmmaker shares the story behind her short film selected for a PBS series about life in the Midwest. And Peter Worf and Cecilia Sharp of 90.9 WRCJ have a rundown of holiday weekend activities in Metro Detroit. But first up, the Detroit Regional Chamber's annual Mackinac Policy Conference takes place next week. Business, policy, and community leaders will gather on Mackinac Island for important conversations on issues facing the state. Zoe Clark, Michigan Radio's political director and One Detroit's newest contributor, sat down with Chamber CEO Sandy Barua and Conference Chair Matt Elliott, president of Bank of America Michigan, for a preview in this Future of Work report. Folks who are new to Michigan or haven't heard of the Mackinac Policy Conference before, what is it? Why does it matter? So the Mackinac Policy Conference is unique. It's a terrific asset that the Chamber happens to be stewards of. But it's essentially Michigan's senior management retreat mm. that takes place on an island where we have you sequestered with no cars, uh, mediocre cell phone uh, reception, uh, but it's really a uh, it's a management retreat in the sense that we're bringing together academic leaders, business leaders, civic leaders, obviously political leaders to be in one place at one time to really address the opportunities and challenges that Michigan has before us. What are we going to do about these opportunities and challenges? And the great thing about it is, is that all these leaders are there. I mean, these are all C-suite leaders mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're all accessible. If you're media, if you're a fellow attendee, everyone's accessible on equal terms and relationships are created, discussions are had that would take months to schedule individually but you can have dozens of them in the span of an hour. Matt, as chair of the conference, you get to put a big imprint into the theme, and the theme this year is the power of and. Tell me about that and, and how you're thinking about that theme. Well, as Sandy mentioned, <clears throat> that this is a, a conversation amongst business leaders, civic leaders, and others that in the current environment is very often framed in either or terms. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're Democrat or Republican, mm -hmm. you're left or right, you're Spartan Wolverine. Um, but we all know from a lot of personal experience, and all of us have this, is that the best ideas, the, the best solutions come when multiple points of view are brought to, uh, to the table, sometimes after a really healthy debate. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is leverage that power of and, bring some, some concepts together that may have some constructive tension to them, and see if we can drive forward for better solutions for everybody. Uh, here at One Detroit, the future of work is something we talk a lot about. Talk to me about the future of work and how that might intertwine into these conversations up at the island. We will cover uh, the future of work in several different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the most obvious one is we'll talk a lot about talent. And one of the things we're going to do, not only in this session, but others, is try to do a level set with some data. We'll also talk about things like electrification and, and the, the transformation of the automotive and mobility industry, which will have a huge impact on all of us in Michigan. 
Help me uh, understand for someone living right now in Detroit and Southeast Michigan who isn't going to the island, how what is happening on the island could affect daily lives in the future of Michigan. So I'd say two things. First of all, uh, it uh, what happens on the island doesn't stay on the island. Mm -hmm. It is the opposite of Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, you know, first of all, uh, the sessions are streamed. So what our audience is seeing when you're sitting in that you know that main theater room, mm -hmm. listening to either Bill Ford or Liz Cheney mm -hmm. or Fareed Zakaria or Santa Ono, mm -hmm. you can watch for free thanks to our partnership with Detroit Public mm -hmm. Television. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would say is that the conference has a great history of working on long-term challenges that eventually come to fruition that affect all of us. Example one, outside these windows you can see the building of the Gordy Howe Bridge. Mm -hmm. That is something that the conference and the chamber worked on for literally 20 years, highlighted at, at the conference. The uh, car insurance reform bill was signed at the conference in 2019 celebrating a bipartisan win mm -hmm. and today's very non <laughs> non-bipartisan uh, environment uh, the final pieces of the grand bargain that got Detroit through the municipal bankruptcy were sealed at the conference so there's a whole history of things both big and small that kind of come to fruition or get their roots started at the conference mm -hmm. This is going to be the first conference in, well, ever, <laughs> where Democrats are running the show in Lansing, right? Uh, the governor, both chambers of the legislature. Has that changed the dynamic as you put this conference together or expectations of what might happen with this sort of trifecta? Regardless, you know, who's in control, if it's, an, if it's the R's or the D's, mm -hmm. we try to program the conference in a very bipartisan way. We mm -hmm. take pride in the fact that the Detroit Regional Chamber is a bipartisan business organization. Mm -hmm. We work with and equally are offended by both sides uh, of, of the aisle. The way it does change is that obviously when, you know, when you have Repo uh, Democrats in control or Republicans control, mm -hmm. you'll see more of that party on mm -hmm. stage. Like, mm -hmm. for example, our governor and the mayor of Detroit, both Democrats, they're going to be featured. If they were Republicans, you would see them as Republicans. Mm -hmm. Matt, what are you most looking forward to from the conference this year? I'm very excited about a lot of the speakers. You know, I have our CEO, Brian Moynihan, coming. He'll talk about how the power of and impacts our company and the work that we do around the world. Mm -hmm. Liz Cheney, we've mentioned, mm -hmm. will also be there. Mm -hmm. And what we're hoping is that those those speakers, but also many of the panelists, mm -hmm. drive a dialogue that sounds different and lasts longer, frankly. And mm -hmm. as, as Sandy said, should leave, should go beyond the porch, should go beyond the island, mm -hmm. because we really want to, to sort of start conversations that drive forward for more ands for the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. Sandy, what are you most looking forward to? Uh, I am really looking forward to this um, kind of this umbrella theme that, that Matt has created about the power of Anne, knitting things together. Uh, you know, we need to move as Michiganders away from trying to address our challenges and address our opportunities through purely a programmatic approach. We need to set an umbrella. What is the culture in which these programs are taking place? What is our North Star? Um, so tying together or weaving together these multiple ands to create a bigger picture for a bigger strategy. And Detroit Public TV will provide live coverage of the Mackinac Policy Conference at OneDetroitPBS.org beginning Tuesday, May 30th. Plus, a special one-hour episode of One Detroit from the conference airs on June 1st at 7 p.m. Let's turn now to the Memorial Day holiday coming up on Monday. It's a day to recognize the men and women who gave their lives for this country. One Detroit contributor Bryce Huffman spoke with three military veterans about what the holiday means to them. Since 1868, Memorial Day has been a time to honor fallen soldiers from every branch of the U.S. military. At the VFW, or Veterans of Foreign Wars post in Royal Oak, we sat down with three veterans to talk about how each of them commemorates the holiday. So Houston, tell me again, how did you begin serving? How did you begin serving in the Army? I began to serve in the Army in 1943 when they drafted me. This is Houston Pritchett, 
a 103-year-old World War II veteran and his daughter Deborah. Pritchett is hard of hearing, so his daughter helped relay my questions. To his right are Mike Sand and Philip Smith. Both are Vietnam veterans. And Mike, how did you begin serving? I was uh, drafted, and uh, rather than be drafted, I enlisted in the Air Force for four years as opposed to two. All right, and how about you, Phil? The draft was going on. Uh, my neighbor, or a friend of mine, came to my door, knocked on it, and said, what are you doing? I said, we're going to work. He said, no, you're not. Let's go down to, down to the Marine Corps and join, and I did. So tell me, when you first joined, how did friends and relatives respond to that? Friends and relatives didn't respond too good when I first, when I first went in the Army. They were kind of upset. Why is that? I never did get around to figuring that out because I was scared of, of, about going. And when you joined, what did people think in your life? Well, of course, the 60s was a difficult time. You had the, uh, the peaceniks and the patriots. And my father was World War II, my uncles were Korea, and I felt it was my obligation to serve. And I figured if I was going to serve, I'd gain something out of it. So the Air Force was kind enough to accept me. And uh, a lot of my friends, I was kind of drafted when the war was really picking up, 1967. And uh, I had been dating my high school sweetheart for two and a half years. And uh, rather than be drafted, I joined. So I said, um, I, won't be, I won't be back for four years. Do you think we should get married? And before I said married, she said yes. So we married uh, right out of high school and uh, spent four years together in the military. Nice. And how about you, Phil? How did people in your life respond? Well, it's kind of funny because a recruiter thought I wasn't old enough. I wasn't 18, and I was. And he told me I had to get, my, I had to get a signature from my parents to go in. I said, I'm already 18. doesn't matter. You don't look old enough. <laughs> so I got my stepfather to sign the paperwork. My dad was already in the Army. He was still in the Army. Mm -hmm. He was a POW uh, prior World War II, uh, and he was proud. He didn't think I would ever make it in the Marine Corps because of how they are. Uh, but I got through the basic and went on. So, but everybody was proud. Tell me about a friend you served with who unfortunately didn't get to make it back home. I was involved in the air war, spent time in uh, Thailand, and we did the bombings of North Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Operation Rolling Thunder. We lost many pilots, many pilots. We had two uh, reconnaissance aircraft crash one had 19 guys on board, the other one had 21 guys on board. So there's a lot of folks on the wall that I didn't have personal contact with, but they're with me today. So I can just say that I'm sad, I'm sad about it. Veterans are sometimes filled with survivor's guilt, feeling bad that they came home while others did not. Smith says instead of feeling guilty, he just remembers those who didn't come home. And I, well, you continue on. and. I dealt with a lot of veterans. Uh, the job I had, I was a vet, veteran service rep, and you deal with those all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you still remember some, a lot of them, uh, especially members in your organizations that have passed on. All right, and how about you, Mike? Did you ever deal with survivor's guilt? Well, I'm glad to be here, and I feel for those who haven't. I've been to the wall twice in Washington, D.C. Um, we named my VFW post after World War I guy and a World War II hero. And uh, I guess you could say we feel guilty because we're here and they're not, but we did what we had to do. And that's why we served the manner that we do. Uh, did you ever experience that? And how did you process that? Did you experience survivor's guilt? And if you did, how did you handle it? No, nothing to be a feel guilty about. I didn't figure. I was doing the best I could, get a job done, and come home with my family. I didn't feel guilty about it at all. How do you honor your fallen comrades and other veterans in your everyday life? Just to get down to it, I just let the everyday life go on. Nothing I could do about it. I done the best I could. And I'm glad it's over and hope nothing like that don't happen again. And I just have one more question. 
How do you personally celebrate Memorial Day and why is it important? Memorial Day is a day of remembrance of those who have went before us, the ones who have fallen. Uh, I celebrate it, I guess I go to Memorial Day Parade in Dearborn. I'm part of that. Um, probably the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years or more. I encourage people to go out and celebrate Memorial, not just shopping at the store, not just having picnics, not just get together, but appreciate what we call the guardians. And I don't care if the guardians are your police and fire, your National Guard, Homeland Security, our military people, they put their lives on the line. And we're gonna be uh, participating in the St. Clair Shore 70th Parade. They, tip, they honor veterans like you wouldn't believe. There's 14 uh, conflicts that Detroiters have served in over the years and we're not appreciated. We have the Montfort Point Marines, we have the Tuskegee Airmen, we have the Triple Nickel Airborne fellas, we have 1,500 junior ROTC cadets march in our Veterans Day Parade. Why aren't they being recognized? And I'm asking the city of Detroit to help us provide a veterans memorial in the city in a prominent place so we can recognize all these people and encourage our young junior ROTC cadets and our young Marines and our uh, Air Force uh, cadets, because the service, I, I will tell you, the service probably saved my life. And I've, I've gained so much from that, and I'm giving it back. Detroiter Ozi Uduma is among eight emerging filmmakers of color whose work will be featured in the Homegrown Future Visions project now streaming on PBS. The project showcases short films about the histories, cultures, and prospective futures of the Midwest. Uduma's film, Detroit Weed A, examines the history and future of a social club founded by Nigerians who immigrated to the city in the 70s and 80s. One Detroit's Bill Kubota spoke with her about the story behind the film. Right now, it's time for the adults to do their new year. Uh, end of year. And you know what that means? It means dance, 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 and dance. Detroit We Day, a short PBS film about the lives of Nigerians in Detroit, preserved in snapshots and on VHS tape. To the uninitiated, this is an extremely chaotic scene. But for me, this is what it means to beat Nigerian in Detroit. The title is basically a Nigerian English or a Nigerian pigeon, and it's just essentially rough translation of Detroit, we're here. Of all the places my parents, aunties, and uncles could have immigrated to, they chose Detroit. It was my way of fusing both one part the Nigerian community and also like the kind of throw to acknowledgement of Detroit, I should say. They came to a place that was the complete opposite of where they grew up. I'm really excited for the larger community to see the film because they- Detroiter Ozi Uduma directed Detroit uh, Weed Day. There has been a lot of like just pride and happiness around the existence of this film and some type of documentation uh, of the history of the community. The Nigerian diaspora, many emigrated to the United Kingdom in places across yeah, the U.S. So, uh, outside of Detroit, we have everywhere from Chicago to New York. Uh, Houston, Texas is the one that is like, I would call the the headquarters of the Nigerian diaspora, Atlanta, LA. So we're like the Nigerian diaspora is pretty big. But in terms of Detroit, a lot of folks came to Detroit because of the educational opportunities. So a lot of the elders in my film went to Wayne State. We don't know anybody here. We don't have family here. I've never been in a big city before. So it was scary, of course. It became obvious to many that we are here to stay. Military oppression in the old country had worsened. Through their social club, Nigerians here found a way to hold on to their culture. The Old Bende Cultural Association of Michigan became a pillar of support for new immigrants from the Bende area of Abia State in Nigeria. For my dad, the kind of big umbrella organization, the Nigerian Foundation of Michigan, was founded sometime in the mid I think late 80s, early 90s, and so those parties have been going on for a long time. And then when they go to these events and then they wear their gele, they wear their wrap, and you see the beauty and the elegance of our clothes, it also amplifies the beauty and the elegance of our culture and where they come from and who they are. You know, you, you kind of like, uh, you try to navigate two worlds, right? Because here in this household, you're Nigerian, like, 
you're not American, like, it's very clear that that's the statement that's said, but when you go to school, right, um, you're just like a black kid. It is not just the Nigerian community that we're growing up with, but the larger black community in the Detroit area. And so for us, you know, it was easier in some ways, I think. I think there was always fears from our parents that, oh, would people make fun of us because our names are different or the kids, you know, the kids eat different foods. We're not sending them to school with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We're sending them to school with like rice and plantains and how will the other kids react to our children. As a majority black city, it feels like home. There's so much pride in being a Detroiter of the diaspora. To be West African in Detroit, there's more awareness now the music, the food, it's the internet and social media spreading the word. There are a lot more Nigerian restaurants that are very popular in the city. Turning on the radio and hearing Afrobeats was something that I never imagined would happen as a kid. I don't have to do too much of the explaining about this community as much, especially to folks who are in the Metro Detroit area. There's a new generation of young Nigerians in the city using their talents to preserve the work, history, and culture of our people. Now, what I've learned as of recent is that a lot of people don't know that there are a lot of Africans in the Midwest, particularly in Detroit. I, I don't want folks to fear the fact that there are, you know, folks who are immigrants, folks who are maybe not a part of the traditional American story who are here in this country. In her film, Ozio Duma asks, Long term, how can Detroit's Nigerian traditions be kept alive? Detroit We Day is a start. Everybody's story, everybody's histories should be documented. I hope things like my film can act as a bridge or act as this piece to help connect, you know, one family to another family or one potential group of friends to another group of friends, because I think those bridges and those connections are very, very important. Ozi Uduma's film, Detroit We Day, premieres June 1st. Go to OneDetroitPBS.org to learn more. Now, let's look at some of the events and activities coming up in Metro Detroit. Peter Worf and Cecilia Sharp of 90.9 WRCJ have today's One Detroit Weekend. Hi, I'm C Sharp with 90.9 WRCJ. Hi, I'm Peter Worf with WRCJ. Cecilia, let's talk about a few things people can check out over the weekend and beyond. What are you cooking up, C? Well, I've got something good, Peter. I'm going to start right here in our own backyard in the cube at Orchestra Hall. Tomorrow night, harpist Brandy Younger will be here paying homage to legendary Detroit harpist Dorothy Ashby and premiering music from her latest album, Brand New Life. It happens at 8 o'clock p.m. in the Cube at Orchestra Hall. So, Peter, what are you stirring up over there? Well, at the DIA, folks can drop into a drop-in workshop on Bojagi. Generations of Korean artists have made patchwork cloths called Bojagi. Traditionally, they created these cloths from scraps of fabric found in the home, carefully sewing them together by hand, using them to cover food, wrap gifts, or carry everyday items. Classes are on May 27th and 28th from noon to 4 p.m. The Movement Music Festival is one of the most anticipated events of May. If you want to keep the music going long after a night at the festival ends, look no further than Spotlight Detroit. Spotlight is the host of the official Movement After Parties. On any given night, you may hear Louis Vega, Ricardo Villalobos, Carl Craig, DJ Minx, or Kevin Saunderson. Catch the beat May 27th through the 29th at Spotlight Detroit. Peter, Memorial Day weekend is also a time to commemorate those who lost their lives. That's right. And Monday, May 29th at 9.30 a.m. at the Dearborn Memorial Day Parade, Michigan's oldest Memorial Day Parade will return for its 97th year, hosted by the city of Dearborn and the Dearborn Allied War Veterans Council. The parade honors veterans and those who lost their lives while serving their country. Friday through Sunday, join the DSO and powerhouse vocalists Tamika Lawrence, Coco Smith, and Blaine Krause as they celebrate leader, icon, and singer Aretha Franklin. Performances are on Friday at 10.45 a.m. and 8 o'clock p.m., Saturday at 8 p.m., and Sunday at 3.45 p.m. Peter, you know, Aretha Franklin had so many hits. What's one that you can't get enough of? Gotta be R-E-S-P-E-C-T. How about you? It's ain't no way that's the one for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's so much happening around Detroit over the weekend. For 
WRCJ. I'm Peter War. And I'm C Sharp from 90.9 WRCJ. Here's more of what's happening for this weekend. Hope to see you around. That will do it for this week's One Detroit. Thanks for watching. Head to the One Detroit website for all the stories we're working on. Follow us on social media and sign up for our weekly newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.